everybody, this is Ross Ratty, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, how to use some of that stuff in the kitchen, and then also how to grow it. And usually the more interesting and rare fruits that you guys have probably never heard of. Um, so this episode is actually no different. We're going to be talking about some nice perennial food sources that some of which you guys probably have never even experienced or have grown yourself. Um, and these are perennial food sources here that are very early in the season that give you a nice abundance of food after a nice long drought of not having anything from the garden or anything from the orchard. So these are really, in my mind, very special because of how early they are. Um, and this will be across the board. It's not just where I live. This will be where you guys live as well. Um, so that you guys can have these sort of perennial food sources. Now, I guess that's sort of what makes perennials great is that you really have such little input, such little care. You plant them once, you set them up for, uh, for a good start, for a good life, and they kind of just take care of themselves at that point. There's really little maintenance involved um, after that. So... Um, things like my asparagus is one that we harvested here in this recent video on YouTube that we're going to put out actually tomorrow. Um, this will take you guys around the yard and show you guys a nice harvest tour of different things that we harvested in May. And um, the asparagus is just done wonderful this year. It's really not all that mature just yet either. It's probably been in the ground I think now for two or this is probably its third year. So for two full years, now entering its third year, I had it in pots prior for a couple years, but overall it's really not all that mature and I'm able to get myself uh, for a family of four, a couple of nice harvests of food for stir fries and different things that we want to eat. You know, it's not giving us food every day, but at least once a week, I'm able to get a nice harvest to be able to have um, asparagus spears with our dinner. Um, and you know what? The family loves them. I'm not personally a big fan of the flavor in terms of how they compare to the store-bought quality, right? That's what we like to compare here on the on the podcast is, is it worth growing from a foodie standpoint? And I think there is some nice uh, benefits there. It's definitely a lot fresher. It's definitely got a lot more nutrients in it. Um, the flavor is a lot more mild. You can eat them fresh you don't even have to cook them they're very tender they're extremely good but i'm not like so overjoyed by them that uh i'll never buy store-bought asparagus again you know they're i'm not getting spoiled by by the asparagus here um however it is free food and that's how i like to look at it so the asparagus is definitely one of them that sends up shoots very early in the season probably one of the earliest things that you can get out of a perennial that's also really good. Something else you can get is green onions um, or any sort of allium chives. There's so many of these that are just even weeds around the yard at that time. You'll see wild chives and wild onions just start sprouting up all over the yard before you even start mowing the lawn, before the grass even starts growing. And you can harvest uh, wild chives in your yard. Um, I've even transplanted a couple into my beds um, but green onions are so easy even the the Egyptian walking onion uh, which I've talked about in prior videos that I, I don't really I'm not really a big fan of them they don't really make a whole lot of sense but what you can do is just use them as a perennial green onion and that to me is enough to uh, make them sort of worth their weight in uh, in what everybody keeps saying is like you know, an amazing crop to grow. Um, I've also experimented and I'm going to continue experimenting with more perennial sources of garlic and um, elephant garlic uh, because elephant garlic is more of like a perennial leek, right? You don't have to harvest them for the bulbs every year. Um, you can simply harvest them for the leeks and um, leave the bulbs in there. Cut the cut the leeks out every year you get yourself some nice stalks that's pretty it's pretty solid um 
Now, the garlic itself, what I like to use for the garlic is if you really want it to have them as a perennial source of food, you could harvest them as scapes instead of the actual bulbs, right? We harvest and plant annual garlic every year, taking from the biggest and the best, right? The biggest cloves from the biggest bulbs, you plant them in the ground, you then get the following year, um, at least here in this climate, in warmer climates, you can get them in that season. But here in this one, you plant them the, the prior fall, you, you harvest them the following season around June, sometime around June 15th, maybe end of July, but uh, you essentially get them um, these bigger bulbs doing it that way. And that's what you harvest and that's what you store and cure is the bulbs. But if you wanted to do this as a perennial source, you could very easily uh, use them for the scapes. If you can grow hard neck garlics, get them through the winter time, every season they're going to do that. Uh, they're going to put out these scapes and you could, I would imagine if you could figure out a way to do it. So normally what we do is we plant the garlic in the fall, which is what you would want to do in a colder climate. Then that kind of does that, that, uh, that, cold requirement that they need if there's a certain word for it i'm blanking on here but all that hard neck garlic needs that cold requirement to then put out the scape i believe so if you put them in the fall and you plant them in the fall the following season you're going to get the scapes but let's say you want to make them as a perennial um i guess you would just harvest the scapes every year and leave the plants in there um leave the bulbs in there and then eventually they're just going to keep re they're going to re-sprout every single year they're going to keep sending up um new shoots i guess in the fall if they don't rot in the ground um you could potentially just keep repeating that process because uh, then it's not just the the clove that's sending up a new shoot that gets you one single scape it's then actually a bunch of garlic from the bulb that had formed are sending up multiple different shoots yeah they're going to be smaller scapes they're going to be smaller bulbs smaller cloves but you're probably going to get a, a reliable perennial source of scapes that way and the garlic scapes are a delicacy they're so so good um, and i harvested a bunch here in this particular video um you could also sort of think of this in a way with uh, certain brassicas. There are some perennial brassicas. Um, I know that there are perennial leeks, uh, well, they're alliums, but I know there's perennial um, broccoli. I know that there's perennial, um, it's called sea kale. There's perennial kales. There is different, many different types of perennial kales. The sea kale actually gets you florets um, in a perennial form, kind of like um, these mini florets that you can harvest. You can also harvest the leaves, but there is plenty of perennial kales in more milder winters. And, you know, you can definitely plant, even tree collards can form you a perennial source of collards. So, you know, there's many different sources of kind of or alternatives to the annual form of these vegetables you could be growing them as as um as perennials in some in some way um now another thing that we constantly overlook is mushrooms i overlooked it for years but it's so easy to grow these wine cat mushrooms that i've been doing a number of videos on these things it's such a joke guys getting this this mushroom is one of the easiest mushrooms to grow to cultivate to inoculate in your wood chips you could just very simply do a lasagna style bed you have to have the right site selection in a way because the wine caps they actually like sun so get a sunny part of your yard put down some fresh wood chips that you get from a local tree service uh, of a hardwood species Put, put a layer of those down, put some cardboard down before, maybe you tear open the cardboard, put the corrugated sides up, water that in really nice, put a layer of wood chips down, put down your inoculant, um, maybe you have some sawdust spawn, put that down, then layer on some more wood chips, then put down some more inoculant, then put down another layer of wood chips, water that all in really good, get a nice, uh, you know, 
four to six inches of wood chips, you're gonna have so many wine cap mushrooms the following season. I did that in the fall in September. And then May the following year, um, I had a t I have a ton of wine caps. I don't even know what to do with them. I had to give some away to friends. In fact, that's actually what this harvest was here, was I gave all of them away to two of my friends. Um, so that's something you guys can do, uh, is very easily cultivate mushrooms. And again, it's a free source of food. I find that these particular wine caps, they're not really the best mushroom um, in terms of flavor. Yeah, they're good, um, but I wasn't blown away like you would of a shiitake or maybe a lion's mane um, or maybe like a morel. I was uh, kind of comparing them to button mushrooms that you get at the store. They have a, a pretty good flavor. They're a lot fresher. Uh, they're free, right? You get your wood chips. That's basically a free service. You can even pay $20 if you want um, for them to deliver the, the wood chips to your house. Uh, you could even do it with straw if you want. Straw is a pretty free resource, easy to get or very cheap. And then the actual inoculate themselves is really easy to find as well. Uh, you could even take the inoculant from somebody else's mushroom bed and put it along uh, underneath your wood chips. So it's uh, it's really affordable and um, it's like a one and done thing. You're never going to lose the mother mycelium of these mushrooms. You can always keep feeding them new fresh wood chips or even move the mycelium to other mushroom beds that you want to create. Um, so that that's mostly the, the harvest that we did here in this particular video, but we have some things coming in um, very soon in the next week or two that will put us at the end of, they usually ripen either mid-May to the end of May or the first couple weeks in June. And these are just, again, some of the best things that you can, you can ripen in like, you know, for the first couple things of the season. Maybe if you're going into mid-June, you're kind of pushing it. But the apricot is definitely one of the earliest stone fruits that you guys can grow. And they'll put out fruit usually in early June to mid-June in a normal year. Assuming you don't get an issue of, um, of having a problem where, you know, you have a late frost. Same thing with the cherries. You'll get some cherries early to mid-May. Um, as you can see, these are my dates here from last year. And I'm looking here at my spreadsheet that I put in the description, guys, of all my videos. So you can open this up if you guys want. Um, it's at the bottom of the description there. And then uh, let's see, what else we got here? We also have coming in is actually the raspberries. The first crop uh, is pretty abundant. I uh, Normally they'll ripen sometime in mid-June. It's kind of pushing it towards maybe even towards July. They then finish up and then there's a break. And then they continue in August all the way till frost. But uh, this year I had a really significant first crop of raspberries that are going to be coming in. Um, you may even have some blueberries that ripen quite early. There are some very early varieties that will do that for you. Um, around mid-June, I imagine, you could probably get some. Um, the strawberry, though, is really the one that puts itself above, I think, the rest. Because it's really is the first if not one of the first fruits to ripen every year consistently without fail um, particularly the early glow has been historically one of my earlier raspberries but the Rucker Scarlet this year is going to be the first one um, now that it seems a bit more mature it may even be earlier than the early glow however Mar de Bois it seems right along the lines of just right there uh, it's just a weird year this year of our spring and how strange it's been. We're just getting these fruits a bit later, like a week later than we, we normally would. And it's the same thing with my other fruits here, like my honeyberries and um, different types of berries that I'm going to get into here, like my currants. We'll talk about those in a minute. But, um, you know, the strawberries are really quite something in terms of what you can compare them to the store quality as what I want to really touch on because the you know the raspberries are the same thing we could always go back to those but the color of these fruits first off really then translates to a different flavor so if you guys have a different colored raspberry or a different colored strawberry they're going to taste different there are white strawberries um, that taste like pineapple 
There are uh, purple strawberries now that I'm really trying to try and see what those taste like. They should have a more intense ra uh, strawberry flavor. The Mar de Bois are not necessarily purple, but they're a darker red and they taste a lot like the Alpine strawberries. And that's something I also have ripening right now. We just got um, a harvest yesterday on the 25th of May of the uh, the Alpine strawberries. I picked up, I believe it is the 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 white sole Alpine strawberry, which really does taste like pineapple mixed with with strawberries, and um, those are outrageously good. Um, particularly the red alpine strawberries because the red alpine strawberries you take a really intense strawberry that you ripen at home far different way superior than what you get at the store but you take a, a nicely ripened mar de bois which has basically the flavor of grape juice welch's grape juice injected into the strawberry you take that multiply that intensity by two and you get an alpine strawberry that's red i mean they're just outrageously good um, every single year without fail so that's a big one there um, is the alpine strawberry and um, yeah I'm happy to say that they're not as early as the the regular strawberry types but um, they're up there and they're ever bearing they produce all year um, certainly it'd be a nice idea to get yourself a bed of those and you'll be you know picking these little berries but they're so so good I mean there's very few berries that can compete and it's also the same thing with the raspberries they have different colors and different there are different colors of raspberries that I'm growing I'm growing black raspberries red raspberries purple raspberries pink raspberries and yellow raspberries they all have different flavors and it really is quite something to have such a reliable source of those foods now I'm not growing goji berries anymore so I should probably take these out but you know these are two fruits that I know historically have been very early in the beginning of June every year reliably. So is the mulberry. The mulberry here, which I, I don't have any Girardi that's going to fruit for me, but uh, my Illinois Everbearing every year is the first week or the second week in June. Always puts out a reliable crop. Um, assuming you get no late frosts, but the, the right mulberry will wake up at the right time for your climate. Um, so you need to find something that isn't going to wake up too soon, as some of them do. Um, what else we got? We got the currants. And the currants, historically here, they're coming in at the earliest, uh, is early early June. And that's the red currant. The red currant definitely looks like, at least right now, it's going to come in very soon. Um and it is the 26th of May, so maybe we can even get them before June this year. Uh, they seem to be really far ahead. And these are not really my favorite fruits, but because they're so early and there's not really an abundance of fruit, that you can eat them fresh, and they are pretty darn good. You can put them in kombucha. It makes a great kombucha. Um, you can also put them in uh, jams and pies and process them in really any way you can think of. Um, I'm not necessarily a big fan of them, but I'm going to try, I think, this year making some wine out of red currants. I think it'd be interesting to try that whole process with these guys. I should really get that started here and try to get all the things I need to, to do some wine. Um, we've also got here, let's see, the... The gooseberries are really quite far ahead this year, and I would expect probably an earlier date, maybe mid-June, so we can maybe throw them in. It's like a really early grape is how I like to think about them. But there's two fruits that are left here that really are above and beyond. Well, also, there's the bush cherry, which I totally forgot. Um, and the bush cherries, we've talked about an entire length of fruit talk. We had a discussion on these. Um, I actually got rid of my carmine jewel. But my, uh, my Romeo and Juliet bush cherries are actually quite good. I really do enjoy them. Um, they're pretty comparable to these Bing-type cherries, and they do ripen early June. So really soon, in the next couple weeks, I'm going to be swimming in fruit, and it's going to be a really nice, uh, nice thing. Now, 
what is nice to have and what is becoming one of my favorites is the Gumi. We've talked, I think, on the podcast about Gumi, but we've done a number of videos and I can't wait to talk more about this plant because it really is just incredible. Um, it's one of those fruits that I don't think really gets a whole lot of credit and a whole lot of attention and it should. Um, I would even say it might be in my top five favorite fruits right now. Puts out a really abundant crop early in the season. Um, you can see the date here was 6-3 last year that they started. Um, and the reason they have their name Gumi is that they taste like gummy bears is what I was told. That was the, the word on the street. I didn't believe it. I thought it was ridiculous. After a couple years of growing them, I realized it's true. <laughs> they are pretty much the fruit form of gummy bears. They taste like gummy bears. Um, and they also have a texture similar to gummy bears because they'll dry up on the tree. No problem, by the way. And they'll put out um, fruits that are semi-dried on the tree that really do resemble a gummy bear. Uh, it's really quite something. And they're really good. They have a little bit of astringency in them that almost never goes away. But I think that adds to the flavor. I really enjoy the experience of eating them. The honeyberry is a fruit that's probably the earliest uh, or right on par with the strawberries. Now, it's kind of a debate though because people say that they're the earliest, but they're not really the earliest because the strawberry ripens before them to perfection. The honeyberry will turn blue earlier than the strawberry, but once the honeyberry turns blue, you gotta wait like two weeks before you pick it anyway. So you can't really say that they're ripe, you know what I mean? Um, I would say these dates here add two weeks to these and that's really the accurate date but they all do ripen around the same exact time I find um, they are quite good but you want to really process them in some way um, I'm trying to find sweeter varieties like the Boreal Beast and the Boreal Beauty this is a fruit that really resembles in visual appearance the blueberry um, they're a different shape and they look different, but they're a similar color to that blue blueberry that has even the, um, the bloom on it, which is that yeast that forms on the outside of certain fruits like figs and grapes and blueberries and different things. Um, they look similar, but they actually taste quite different. They taste like a combination of kiwi and I think uh, grape is what I said last year. So they're interesting they have a really wild berry flavor and some of these berries can get really out there and really bring out some great interesting flavors that otherwise you'll never experience in life so i think uh, the honeyberry is certainly worth another look and i'm trying to figure out if i can maybe eat these fresh in the future and to see if they're really worth it in the future it's still i think we're a couple years away from really having some sort of accurate decision but these are a number of perennial food sources, guys, all of these, that will reliably put out food for you every single year, assuming no late frost. I mean, it seems like the gumi, the strawberries, the raspberries are pretty much solid. I mean, they're, you can really almost never go wrong with those. Um, the currants are pretty solid. The, the mulberry and I would argue the stone fruits and also the um, the honeyberries are definitely a bit more difficult in terms of a late frost. So you may struggle there. Even the the um, the cherries as well, the bush cherries, you may struggle with some sort of late frost. Although this year they all got through it. They all fruited. Um, we're going to have a nice set of, of crop this year on a lot of these different things. I'm excited. It's early in the season. That's the best part. I hope everybody out here will think about a lot of these food sources I mentioned and start growing them in their yards um, or in your yards. We'll uh, we'll talk to everybody soon out there. What I want to do in uh, in next episode is have some sort of question and answer at the end of the talk. Um, I know we do some that are live, so if you want to do a live video of the podcast with us, we do a Q and A at the end. Uh, we may consider doing one of those soon. However, I would like to do some sort of Q&A on the, the episode here of Fruit Talk. So if people have questions, 
email them in. Um, and also you can contact me on different forms of social media. You can um, reach out on, on YouTube, even put them in the comments on YouTube. If you put them in the comments, I'd appreciate it because that's actually where uh, I get a little help from you guys and it actually drives a little bit more traffic with the algorithms to the to the podcast. So um, yeah, ask, ask any questions you guys want to know and then we'll try to get to them at the end of next episode of Fruit Talk. And last thing I want to leave you guys with is our, our, our website here. We've put a lot of time and energy into getting this thing really nice and neat. It looks gorgeous. We have a blog post here. Uh, a section for our blogs. We have a section for our videos. It looks beautiful. We have a section for our podcast. Um, it's really, really awesome. Our consulting page is here. It really has come out and looking beautiful. I uh, want to just drive as much traffic to this website as I can um, to eventually maybe get some additional rankings on Google because we are going to put this on Google and have it rank on the uh, on the search engine there so you never know we might get some nice traffic from the website we'll see everybody soon all right take care guys stay safe we'll see everybody for next week's episode of fruit talk